All right, so I'm sure we'll be okay. All right now, I'll be quiet. I'll okay. be quiet and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I appreciate it. Um, this is Mental Models in Cybersecurity, and uh, we're going to talk about thinking like a hacker does not work. And I know, listen, I know, believe me, I know um, that there, there are some, uh, you know, people who disagree with that, which is fine, you know, which is absolutely fine, because I'm not right or wrong about that statement, okay? So, but I want to go through why I say that and what these models are and how we can use them. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so this is me, Cheryl Abram, all right? I, um, and these are just a couple of things that I talk about in my, in my resume. I just wanted to bring out the things that would really help you to see why I feel like I'm able to talk about this topic and say the things that I'm saying today, okay? So I have a book on Amazon called Longing to Learn because that's really what I do. I absolutely love, love, love learning. I love anything that has to do with uh, teaching and instruction and all of that, okay? So I, I've always enjoyed that and, um, and I brought that to the cybersecurity field with me. Um, I used to be in HR, I was in HR, years in the government and then uh, came over to cybersecurity. So along with my, uh, my um, experience and love of learning, I'm also a social worker. <laughs> so I brought that along with me too, here to cybersecurity. And you'll see a lot of this uh, in, in this uh, presentation moving forward. I of course have my uh, security plus because the contract that I'm on required it. I got my CISA first, my cybersecurity analyst first. Um, and I actually really enjoyed that test. I, I enjoyed studying for it. I enjoyed taking it. Um, it was the first one I got. I got that before Security Plus, but um, I just love everything about the analysis and all that. I also really, really enjoy, and I do this with my uh, very best friend. We go to Cali, Len Cali Linux, and um, we've done some bone hubs together. We do CTFs, all that. I really enjoy that. I, I really, really do. So when I first came into the field, though, I noticed some things. And um, I had questions, you know, so those questions have led me to come up with, uh, with what you're going to see today, okay? Now, so I want you all to leave here with three things, okay? I want you to be able to consider the way we talk in cybersecurity, the way we train, and the way we think, okay? And hopefully I can give you some tools um, to help to begin to do that. Okay. Now, normally references are at the end, but I wanted to tell you what I did um, at the beginning so that you know where a lot of this information came from. I did not just stay in the cybersecurity field to find this information. I went into electrical engineering, into biomimicry. I love biomimicry because that's where you go to nature to help you solve everyday problems that humans have, okay? Neural networks, I went into that look at you know the mind and how we think and you know how behavior is connected to thinking and acting and things like that uh and other related disciplines like civil engineering okay um automotive design which was a lot of fun and i also looked at other countries and what they're doing in cybersecurity. okay so you'll see a, a lot of those kinds of things in here now look at this bike okay now, if you were to sit on this bike, now you'll see the seats are like this, okay? They're like that. So if you sat on one side and somebody you knew sat on the other side, so you're facing each other, would it work? Would you be able to move? Would you be able to, you know, uh, bike around the neighborhood? Just looking at this bike, what, what do you think you'll be able to do? Um, and whatever you come up with, whether you think we'll be able to ride the bike or it's not going to go anywhere, you know, because we're facing each other. How's it going to go anywhere? The decision you make is based on your mental model right now. Okay. So a mental model is something we use every day and it helps us assess the system that we're in so that 
now make a decision, okay? There are other mental models that we use all the time. Some of them, one of them is a, a supply and demand. That's a mental model. The scientific method is a mental model, okay? It's a way to see a system, then make a decision. Um, theory of relativity. Those, so all of those kinds of things are, are mental models, okay? So now I want you to look at this picture and tell me what you see. I show this picture a lot when I talk to um, executives in my, in my leadership uh, trainings. I get all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things, okay? Now it shows a particular thing, but what you see is based on your mental model, all right? y'all are saying here. A cow, somebody sees a skeleton. Rishi doesn't see anything. Uh, Mark Applewhite sees a cow. Does anybody see anything else? Okay. Now all of you are right, okay? Because I said, what do you see is, is, is what my question was. Ooh, somebody sees a bee. Somebody else sees a part of a skull. All right. And again, what you're seeing is based on the mental model and the filter that you have. Now, it's the same picture. Everybody's seeing the same picture. Okay. Something like a satellite image. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. So what it is. What the picture is of is a cow. So for those of you who said that, awesome. So this, this is uh, the ear over here. This is like the side of the face, all right? This is the other side of the face and like the back and there's just shadow back here, okay? So it's a cow's face, ear, side of the face, the snout is down here and another eye right here, okay? I'm gonna show you one more picture to help you see how your mental model works. What is this? What do you see here? Okay, let me see what you all are saying. Um, Issa sees a graffitied cowboy. Does anybody see anything else? Okay, Issa, you're right, or Issa, that, that's a cowboy, it is a cowboy, okay? Now again, I wanted you to see how your mental model works. So many of us can see the same thing, and we know this happens all the time, right? People see an accident or whatever, and they'll have different stories about what actually happened, okay? So the first mental model I wanna talk about is double loop learning. And this quote, I love it. All models are wrong, but some are useful, okay? Who is this? Do you know who, th who knows who this is? Please type it in the chat if you know who this is. But this individual had a whole entire rule named after him because he was dunking, uh, there you go, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. What was his name in this picture? What was his name before he changed it to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Do you know what that is? So dunking, um, the first dunk was in 1937. It was by um, an ind individual at the Berlin Olympics, okay? He was the head of the American team. Now, uh, so he did it back then. You know, it really wasn't an issue. A whole bunch of people weren't doing it. It wasn't a problem, right? But it, when uh, this individual, before his name was Kareem, when he, Lou Alcindor, there you go, Lou Alcindor, that's right. So they created a rule called the Lou Alcindor rule that banned the dunk for 10 years, 
okay? Because this is one of the things that uh, one of the coaches said, Duncan does not display basketball skill, only height advantage. That is not the way basketball is played, okay? We do not dunk over here. It doesn't require any skill to do that, right? And they also said, you know, people are getting hurt and, you know, it's just, it's just not part of the game. We're not doing that, right? And um, I mean, you know, folks thought there were other reasons why, <laughs> why they banned it because of who was doing the dunking, but, you know, but that's another thing. But basketball was played a certain way, okay? Now to do a dunk, even though a dunk gets you what you're trying to get, you know, you're trying to get the points. You want to win the game. And a dunk helps you to do that, but it's not part of the game. You can't do that. It's against the rules. It's a foul. You would get fouled out if you did that, okay? So dunking, when the rules say don't, the rules say we don't do that kind of thing, even though it does get you closer to your goal, we're not going to do it, is an example of double loop. Now, consider this, our current model in cybersecurity. What are the, the fundamental things that we say in cyber? Uh, it's defined by Department of Defense, okay? <laughs> and they've said that, the, that cyberspace is the fifth operational war fighting domain. There's a whole website, I think it's called Fifth Domain or something, you know, that, that goes into how cyberspace is now like land, sea, air, water, and, you know, and uh, I think that's all places that, that we go to war. It's focused on attack and defense, and it's primarily purpose to protect systems and information. Um, there are a plethora of definitions of cybersecurity, but uh, they all really come together to say that this is what it's for, to protect systems and information. Now, again, the Department of Defense has defined cybersecurity. So it just makes sense that it's going to be about fighting. It's going to be about, hey, we're, we're at war. We're, we got to win. It's win or lose. Okay. If, if the Department of Defense had, had, defense had to define, um, uh, I don't know, uh, sewing. Okay. Hey, listen, it's a, it's a war. Okay. We, we're, we're fighting against the fabrics to be and conform to what we want the fabrics to be, you know, because that's what they do. <laughs> it's about protection and defense, okay? That's, that, it only makes sense that they would define it and see it and, and, you know, and it's warfare, okay? It, it only makes sense. So this is what it is, right? War, but the thing about, okay, so war is armed conflict. Okay, where the aim is to reach some objective, but you're going to do it using force. Okay, Bo both sides, you're doing it using force, right? Now, are we double loop learning requires that I ask, are we really at war? Is that really what we're doing in cybersecurity? Now, these are the, the, the two types. Okay, so you have single loop learning, which is what we do now. Okay. Single loop is about continuous improvement. It's about getting better at doing what you're doing now. Right now, you may be at like a basic proficiency or an, or, uh, an awareness level. We want to get you up to advanced, expert. So now that you're, you are able to teach other people so that they can continuously improve, okay, within the confines um, of, of, you know, of, of whatever it is that we're doing. So that's single loop over here. You, you, do, you do some stuff, you perform, you see where you have the errors and you train and learn and you get better so that you can do the thing again and then, you know, perform. So it, it's, a, it's a whole loop. That's why it's called a loop, all right? We don't do anything with this wall. We don't even see this wall. We don't see that, there may, that we may not be doing the right thing right now. That's where double loop comes in. Uh, double loop is about questioning what you're doing. Um, it's about innovating. It's about dunking, okay? When nobody really did that, nobody asked for that, nobody, you know, basketball was doing fine, okay, before dunking. What do we need that for, all right? So double loop is about getting to the wall and, and becoming aware of, you know what? I wonder, I wonder if we could be doing things differently. 
not because something's wrong, okay? Not, not necessarily because it's wrong, just, you know, could we be getting to the goal faster? You know, could we be more efficient in, in some way, more effective in some way, okay? And again, not because we're doing it wrong now, but just, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, let's just ask the question and see. Double loop is not easy, all right? I'm telling you right now, it's, it's not easy to do because you, we feel like there's a, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type attitude, okay? But here today, we're gonna do a little bit of double loop, all right? Let me check over here, make sure I'm not somebody in, okay. At least one person in the world <laughs> has come to the conclusion that cybersecurity act, I mean, cyberspace, we're not fighting in cyberspace, okay? And that is General Michael V. Hayden. He is a retired uh, United States Air Force general. I've spoken about this paper on my uh, channel. My cybersecurity channel is called Person Centered Cyber. And I will, um, you know, provide you all the information with that, you know, after I'm done. But here's at least one person, you know, who, who has seen things differently. And, um, and I have to say, I, I enjoy this paper and I agree with a lot of the things that he says. But, but let, let's us just, just do this thing ourselves, okay? And, and see where we get. Oh, I had to click this thing two times. Okay, so if we're not at war, if we're not at war, then what the heck are we doing? <laughs> like what's going on then? You know, if, if it isn't me against you, us against them, and you know, trying to get territory and push you back and I got the bigger gun and no, my bomb is bigger and you know, and all that. That's not what's happening, what's happening? What could possibly be happening? Let me say it that way. Maybe we're managing risk, okay? It's not about winning or losing. It's about dialing the risk level so that we maintain, so that we stay within a tolerable level of risk so I can get my job done, okay? We are working with organizations, we're working with businesses, corporations, you know, they're not at war with each other. They're trying to make money. They don't wanna to go to war, okay? They want you to love them <laughs> so you can buy their or get their services or whatever, you know? But I wanna do it in a way so that, you know, whatever happens in the landscape, it can't mess up my business. I have a mission, I have goals, I have things I wanna achieve. And I know that there's stuff going on out there. So you cybersecurity professionals, I need you to help me to maintain a risk level that'll still allow me to get my work done, okay? Now, let's look at risk. So there are two basic types of um, uh, risk to manage, okay? The first one is called first order chaos. Now this is, is chaotic situations that are very, very predictable, like the weather, okay? So there are certain conditions that come together to make a, a thunderstorm or a tornado or a hurricane or earthquake, right? And there, you know, we have tools and, and you know, measurement tools that help us to predict, hey, listen, there's a hurricane coming, all right? And you got about uh, this amount of time to get ready because there's nothing we can do. We, we're not, everybody's not going, you know, getting their guns and, and bombs and stuff to fight against the hurricane or the tornado. Uh, the, even though they, they tried to do that, I looked it up back in the 1800s, they created all kinds of things to fight the weather. Okay, to, to make it, to make it, it didn't work. Okay, it didn't work. They tried though, they tried, but we're not doing that. Human intervention does not work with first order chaos. The best we can do to manage in those situations is to focus on how we build our homes, how we build our bridges, you know, what kind of recovery can we do when these, you know, when it's just too much, you know, the, 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 the earthquake, you know, it, we couldn't withstand it, okay? And it destroyed a lot of things. So how can we recover so that so that now we can get back to normal? Okay, that's the best we can do against first order chaos, at least right now. You know, until we invent something to intervene with the weather. You know, um, 
So, okay, here we go. Now the next one is second order chaos. Second order chaos is less predictable because we can intervene. There is something we can do about the conditions that come together to create these chaotic situations. Now here, the risk is managed by interrupting the conditions that come together to create this chaos. For example, I'll use here, when I was in elementary school, I had a bully. There was a bully on the bus who, I mean, he would just, he was a bully, okay? Uh, I would get off the bus, he would get off after me because I, I lived on one side of the street, he lived up the street on the other side, and he would just hit me. Like I never talked to this boy, it was a boy, never said anything to him, he was just a bully. And he saw that I was small, I was a girl, and you know, there was nobody around. So he had the perfect opportunity to take advantage of a vulnerability that he saw, and he would just hit me like for no reason, you know, and I was just so sad, <laughs> you know, because I didn't know why I was being bullied. So I told my mom, you know, and my mom told my brother, I have a big brother, his name is Gary. He's like 10 years older than me. And he, he told, she told Gary, Gary, go to the bus stop, you know, when Cheryl gets off and, and you know, just, just be there to see what happens. And he did. Now, when the bully got off the, off the bus after me, he saw my brother, who's bigger than him, you know, a, a lot taller. You know, my family, they're very tall. So my brother looked older than what he actually was because he was very tall. And he, my brother only had to come out there like two times. And he never messed with me again because he knew my brother coming out there interrupted one of the conditions that created that situation where I was being bullied, okay? Now he knew if I touch Cheryl, if I mess with Cheryl, I'm gonna have somebody else to deal with and I'm not willing to do that. So the bullying stopped. He only had to come out like twice, okay? And, and it was done. That's like a second order chaos because human intervention changes con one or more of the conditions that create that situation, okay? Admit some of these folks. Okay. So we engage with both types of chaos in the cybersecurity community. Okay. And there are, we have opportunities for both types to engage in some double loop learning and wonder can we be doing things differently? When it comes to the things that we cannot control, vulnerability is always gonna be there. You will never, ever, ever, ever do away with vulnerability because the second you harden something here, you just create a vulnerability somewhere else, okay? It's never gonna go away, all right? So that's like the first order. It's never gonna go away. We just have to be sure we have the infrastructure in place. We have to have the engineering you know, in place. We gotta have our recovery you know, on point. What that recovery do? You know, we, we, we just have to, we have to be there for that. For the second one, with the, uh, the human intervention can change it, okay? There are some double loop learning we need to engage in uh, for that one as well. We need to start asking more questions about, are we doing the right things, okay? Not just are we doing it right, but are we actually doing the right, okay? There we go. All right. The next model is called first principle thinking. This is my favorite. The chief enemy of good decisions is a lack of sufficient perspectives on the problem. Now, when you hear first principle thinking, you may have heard it before, you may have heard it in terms of this guy, Mr. Musk, okay? He talks a lot about first principles and how he uses that in what he does, okay? Uh, he talks about how with his project to send a rocket to Mars, which is now called SpaceX, that, that, that's what um, that project is called. He came, uh, he was challenged by the price of rockets. One rocket was like $65 million. And as much money as he has, he's like, I ain't paying that. <laughs> he's like, for one rocket? Uh-uh, <laughs> no, we're not going there. So, and people are like, hey, listen, that's what that's what it costs. Like, what, what do you want us to do? You know, that's that's just what a rocket costs. So he said, you know what? What is a rocket made of? Like, seriously, 
I want to know from the, the molecule, what is a rocket made of? So they start, okay, so there's like titanium, there's copper in it, there's, you know, carbon fiber. I mean, down to the nitty gritty, okay? And after getting that information, he said, okay, so why don't we do this, all right? And he proposed various things for them to do where at the end, he was able to come up with a rocket that worked for what he wanted it to do. Plus he saved like, you know, millions and millions of dollars and made a profit, all right? And he talks about that all the time, okay? Because that's first principles. First principles is like, you know what? I don't, I don't care and I don't wanna hear what other people have been doing, all right? Let's start from the bottom and build up from there. Now, another part of my title is thinking like a hacker does not work. Okay, and again, we're talking about first principles thinking here, okay? I went online and if you go to Google right now and type in think like a hacker, you're gonna see a gazillion. I mean, there are videos, there are podcasts, um, YouTube books, poems, haikus, all kinds of things about thinking like a hacker. And I've gone back, the, the earliest one I saw, and this is just as far back as I went, was uh, well, 2000. So for 21 years, we have been preaching to think like a hacker to make your systems uh, be be better. All right. Uh, okay, so that, that's just what we've been doing. Uh, again, um, I'm saying it's not working, and I'm going to show you why I say that. I'm going to show you why I say that. Let me admit these folks right here. But, uh, but I mean, this is what we're doing. Okay, podcasts, all kind of stuff. Now, I will admit that it is more difficult to know when what we're doing is working, because that's what's in the news. In the news, you hear, you know, about how this huge hack happened at SolarWinds and, and Equifax and OPM and you know, that's the stuff in the news. We're not hearing, oh, this hardening technique worked in this organization, you know, and they, uh, an attack came against it and they were able to extend. We don't hear that stuff in the news, okay? That, that's not gonna make them money, <laughs> you know? This is the kind of stuff we hear. So I, I do know that, I'm, I'm very aware of that. But however, let's look at something here. Now, during World War I, I'm sorry, World War II, um, researchers had a problem. They saw that many uh, bombers were getting shot down in runs over Germany. Uh, and the bullet, the bullet holes, what they wanted to find out was where are they being shot? Where are these bullet holes? And this is an actual picture from, from that study, okay? So they really needed that data and they really needed to study the vulnerabilities. They needed to find out why are our bombers getting shot down and what do we need to do so that that does not happen, at least not happen as much as it's happening. Now, they got all the data and they came up with this picture and they thought, okay, so that means we need to put reinforcements where all of these holes are, okay? So that the bombers don't go down. But the problem, the issue with this picture this is from bombers that made it back. So the bombers that got shot in these areas were still able to make it back. They needed to know where are the bullet holes for the bombers that have crashed in the mountains of Germany. That's what we need to know, okay? So what they did was they took these planes, the ones that came back and saw, okay, where where were they uh, not shot? Where did they not have bullet holes or as many bullet holes? And they discovered that it was in the cockpit, in the engine, and in the tail, the tail, the armor of the tail. So those are the three areas that they reinforced. Not all these, you see all these vulnerabilities, all these vulnerable areas, you know, thousands and thousands of holes. They ignored that. They said, okay, where are we not, where are they not getting shot? Okay, and that's what they reinforced. Okay, uh, are we doing that in some capacity in cyber? I, I, I'm just asking the question. I really don't know. I'm not sure. I'm just asking the question. But are we doing that kind of thinking and analysis? Okay, when it comes to um, 
hardening our system? Or are we just hardening every vulnerability we can find? Like whenever one comes out, okay, harden it. You know, is, is that what we're doing? And is, and is that the right thing to do? Again, I'm just asking a question because I don't know. <laughs> you know. I'm in policy. I write cybersecurity policy, okay? Even though I do do all those other things, you know, uh, um, my specialty is policy. All right. This is why I say it's not working. Speaking like a hacker. There's a 2019 study uh, that talks about the most cyber secure country in the world. Of these, tell me which one you think is the most cyber secure. And I use this particular study um, on purpose because I love, I love the criteria that they use. The United States, China. Jessica said China. Uh, Rishi said United States. Chinasa said China. Ernest said Denmark. Leroy said China. Mark says Japan. Deborah said China. Yes, I got China, Denmark, Japan, United States, okay. Denmark is second for me, says Jessica. The country, based on this 2019 study, that is the most cyber secure in the world is Japan. Now, that's the 2019. The 2020 just came out. Japan has been knocked down a little bit and Denmark has taken its place, but we're gonna work with Japan right now, okay? Because when I created this and I did this stuff, it was Japan. Uh, now, the criteria they used was the percentage of mobile, uh, mobile devices infected with malware, um, computers infected with malware, the number of financial malware attacks, successful financial malware attacks, percentage of telnet attacks, uh, and the percentage of attacks by crypto miners. And, and I love this one. The best prepared countries were those that were most up to date with their legislation. Japan has some amazing legislation regarding cybersecurity. I mean, they really do. And they were knocked down by Denmark because they um, had uh, more successful malware attacks on their mobile devices. Um, and, and, uh, and Denmark was able to, um, you know, to, to get ahead in that area, all right? So first principle thinkers, <clears throat> We question the status quo. We think for ourselves, okay? We, we ain't trying to hear, well, this is the way we've been doing it for the last 30 years. We're not trying to hear that, okay? It don't matter. Uh, we start from scratch and we keep an open mind, okay? We keep our minds open and they have to be. It's, have you guys seen, um, uh, what is the name of that cooking? Uh, chopped, chopped on the Food Channel. Chopped is a perfect example of first principle thinking. You have these uh, chefs, okay? They all get the same basket of food. And it, some of it is the, they got to make amazing desserts with like bubble gum, broccoli, and ice, you know? And they got to come up with something, you know, that is just gourmet, you know? And they do it. Some of these people, they've never tasted this food before. They, some of them are allergic. They can't taste the food because they're allergic to, to a particular thing. But they put it together, never having used this before. You know, and they just put it together and create something absolutely amazing. Okay, I, I, that's just, it amazes me every time. <laughs> you know, it really does. But I mean, we do this all the time, right? But it's hard to see when you're in something for a very long time and you're listening to authorities that say, this is the way we do this, and this is the best way to do this, and there's nothing wrong with it, okay? We have the tendency to not ask the question, okay? Because asking the question, I, I, we just tend to not ask the question, okay? But I feel that if we, because we in this industry are so talented, I mean, it's, it's, the talent is, is off the charts, it's ridiculous, you know? If we can engage in some double loop, and first principle thinking, the things that we can come up with, I'm uh, the things that we can come up with is just, and faster, 
okay? We're gonna come up with them, <laughs> you know, but mental models just help you get smarter faster is, is really what they do, okay? Mental models, we need to use these to help us consider if we're doing the right thing when it comes to the way we talk, all right? This is from the security skeptic. I follow him on um, Twitter. He said to, le to legitimize cracking activities, the tech industry, industry spawned new species of programmer, the ethical hacker. So he's basically saying criminal behavior has been whitewashed. Okay, we're in Black History Month. You know, I, I'm, I'm talking to my folks. Criminal behavior has been whitewashed. And I personally feel because of who was committing the crimes. All right. Hacking is sexy. Why is hacking sexy? Why do we? So I, I, I work with this individual um, in a nonprofit. And we had a meeting the other day. And he, he wants me and, and the partner that I work with on this stuff to come up with like a trailer to get young people interested in the field. You know, and, and he's like, you know, I want I want them to see, you know, uh, the last person who did something. I mean, the kids were so excited. You know, he 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 got their email address and he broke into a website and they were just fascinated. And they, you know, we, we've whitewashed criminal behavior, you know, and we call it ethical. You know, it's like a white lie. Like there's, you know, it, it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's fine. So, I mean, let, let's let, let's let's. Um, Let's consider, let's consider the way we talk and, 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 and put on a pedestal uh, criminal behavior. If they're opportunists, if you're a criminal, you're an opportunist, you're taking advantage of vulnerabilities, just like the boy, if you're a bully, then let's call you a bully, okay? If, if that's what you are. You know, we're, we're not whitewashing bullying. You're doing something, you're in a space you did not ask permission to be in, okay? You're a bully. That's what you are. You're an opportunist, okay? Period. That's, that's just what it is. Let's also consider the way we train. Chris Romeo is somebody that I, I'm connected to on LinkedIn. He said, you cannot hack yourself secure. The hyper-focus on hacking is the broken concept Focus on securing the entire development life cycle instead. I've never met Chris, but I love him. Chris, if you're out there, hey, Chris. So this is from a document um, from Japan. So when I saw that Japan was doing things really well, I looked at all kinds of stuff from Japan. They have a document called Toward Effective Cybersecurity and Training. One of the projects, y'all, I'm telling you, I was jumping up and down in my seat. It's called the Hardening Project, where teams come together to secure a virtual e-commerce website. And you know how you know if they're successful. If the e-commerce website is still able to make money. And what did I say at the beginning? We're working with businesses, okay? Businesses have missions, they have goals. A lot of it has to do with making money, unless you're a nonprofit, but they have goals as well, all right? They're here to fulfill their purpose, to get work done, to help other people to then fulfill their purpose and get work done, okay? Hardening cannot stop that from happening. The same way uh, hackers can't stop it from happening. When, so I worked at OPM when all that stuff was, was coming out and breaking down and old girl got fired, even though she wasn't even there, you know, when that stuff happened, but, you know, they, they need somebody to blame. I was there the whole time, okay? Now, of course, it was an emergency. So before, we had all these things we could do at OPM, all these places we could go. After that, child, I could barely, I, they hardened that system so much. So I had to go sideways to come through the damn front door. Everything was hard. I mean, we, we, websites, I legit, web, like government websites, I used to get, I get easily get to. I had so much trouble. I had to start using my phone, my mobile phone to do my work because everything was just locked down. You needed permission and, and, and sheets, you know, that's why I love this project. Because listen, 
we got work to do. <laughs> we got work to do. You know, but they never talked to us. They never came to, you know, at least I never heard, seen, experienced. Nobody told me that they actually came to the business and was like, listen, this is what we got to do. Help, help us help you. <laughs> okay. You know, we have to do both. We have to keep them out, but we have to allow you also, you know, we want to keep you as safe and within the, the, the level of risk that you can tolerate. We want to keep you in there. Okay. So help us do that. Let's find out what you're doing, what you need. All right. Uh, the way we train people, how to, and listen, let me tell you this one other thing regarding the way we train. I also went on, it wasn't Indeed, it was another uh, job website, Glassdoor. That's what it was. It was Glassdoor to look for uh, jobs in Japan uh, for cybersecurity. There was a SOC analyst position, Security Operations Center uh, analyst. One of the requirements for the analyst, listen to this. One of the requirements for the analyst was that they work with the customer service and the sales team. I said, get the hell up out of here. The SOC analyst has to be involved with customer service and sales. <laughs> I like this why these people number one. They see it's about the business. It's about the business, okay? We have to help these people stay within the level of risk that they can tolerate. You're gonna get some risk ain't going nowhere, just like vulnerabilities ain't, okay? You're always gonna be at risk. But is it at a level that you can tolerate and that the, the business can still go on? And if you get, there is a breach that just completely screws up everything. What that recovery looked like, okay? What, what, what is that? How soon can we get back on board? Because we know this happened. Hurricanes come through, tornadoes come through, stuff happens. Okay, but we recover. And how soon can we do that? You know, if we're not able to stay within the level of risk that we can tolerate. I'm almost done, y'all. And the way we think, let's consider different ways to view not just the problems that we have, but where we feel like there are no problems. Can we still, are we still doing the right thing? All right. And these are some other uh, um, mental models that we can use. There's a website called Model Thinkers. I mean, this is so good. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, Arun, Arun Prune, I think that's how you say his name. Forgive me, Arun, if I'm saying that wrong. But he and, and his colleagues have created this. Um, they came from the learning community. I mean, he's just, he's an amazing person. This website is awesome. So um, go ahead and visit, visit it. It's called Model Thinkers. Um, there are a plethora of models that we can just pull out, just pull out, take them to, to your next meeting, you know, and just try to think about the issues in this way. Just see what it feels like, okay? See what it feels like. And using models, we want to become model thinkers. That's what we want to do. Yes, we want to think like a hacker, yes, okay? But also think like an engineer, Think like a developer, think like a social worker. What would a firefighter do in this, in this situation? How would a child see this issue, should see this problem? Do you know what I'm saying? You wanna have a whole toolbox of models to use, you know, to help us be smarter, faster. And that's all I got, okay? So I am Cheryl Abram and you can connect with me in these places, okay, I'm on LinkedIn, just looking Cheryl Abram. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. I'm not on Instagram a lot. Uh, I don't use that a whole bunch, but I'm on YouTube all the time, person-centered cyber. So you can go there and um, subscribe if you would like. Um, do you all have any questions or anything like that? But I also wanna give a shout out to Dr. Wesley Phillips, my best friend in the world. Um, he, as, as you all can see, I'm very passionate about this stuff. I don't pull punches. I don't. I don't pull my punches at all. And he is very accommodating <laughs> and tolerant of my weird ideas, okay? And, and I, I just appreciate that so much. I really, really do. All right. Um, any questions? 
Uh, Mark Applewhite. Hey, Mark. Yes, my YouTube channel is dope, y'all. So please go ahead and go there. Um, awesome. So I really appreciate you all. I really, 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 really do. I'm so glad you all were here um, and attentive <laughs> and attentive. Uh, and for some, like I said in the beginning, you know, a, a lot of times it's not easy. It's almost like a Yala fix my life. You know how she be making people mad and all that because they, they ain't trying to hear certain things. They're just not trying to hear it, you know. But it's, it, and sometimes you can feel like when somebody has a different idea that you're being attacked or told you're wrong or whatever, when that is totally, I mean, I'm not doing that. Other people might be saying it or whatever, but all I'm saying is there are so many other ways and our capabilities, you know, those of us who are in this field, the work that we do and what we're capable of, oh man, I mean, we just have to use it. That's all. <laughs> just be willing to use it. Be willing to ask questions that nobody else will ask. Maybe they're afraid to ask or I don't know. But, okay. Um, but we can do it. I mean, we can get so much further than we are right now and faster. Okay. And that's the thing. All right. So I know, I think, I don't think I took my whole hour, but um, if you all don't have any other questions, then I will see you on LinkedIn. I'll see you on YouTube. And I'm not sure where Vic is going to post this, but if you have, I think it may be on their YouTube channel. So if it is, please ask questions there. I'll be checking and, um, you know, catch me outside and we, and we can talk. Thank you, Cheryl. You did a wonderful job. This was oh, good. You're very welcome. <laughs> yeah, it was a different angle. You looked at the whole issue in a different way from, you know, our daily way of looking mm -hmm. at it, either from academia or from the, a working uh working areas I, yeah. I think our own backgrounds bring a lot to it oh so yeah. i love the way you looked at it from your background a crime is a crime yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that that was very interesting i loved it yeah thank you thank you so much thank you for being here and for contributing as well you are welcome you take care and have a good one okay you too all right anybody else before i Stop, share, and sign off. You can talk if you want to. Hi, Cheryl. Um, Kelly Hudson, I think you did an amazing Kelly. job as well. Will the slides be made available? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Blacks and Cyber will make the slides available. Again, I'm assuming. Uh, uh, do you mean as the video or this just a, the hard copy of the slides? Hard copy of the slides. Uh, I'll give or it to either Vic. Either or. Yeah, I mean, no, I, I can give give the slides. Uh, I'm, I just have to figure out where we're going to do that. If you're on my LinkedIn, um, I, I'll say it there, like where we'll put them so that you all can get the hard copies. How can I do that? Perfect, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you all know. Hi, Cheryl. Um, I just wanted to add that I truly enjoyed your personality and just how you explained everything. Um, it was very easy to follow. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody else? All right. Well, I will.